Elijah never died. He's still alive. Elijah, you're seeing Elijah from this church, never died. And neither did Enoch. There are two people who never died. Why do you have trouble with Mary being raised from the dead? You know, three days after her death, Elijah and Enoch will come at the end. We'll be two witnesses in the book of Revelation, right? And they'll die, they'll be killed, they'll be martyred, they're going to lay in the streets, their dead bodies. But they'll be raised again, too. So, yeah, we believe she died. She had to die. She was a human being. Just like all of us. It's a common lot for all of us. She died. Real death. Not appearing to be dead. She really died. But she also was really raised from the dead. Again, the common lot of all of us at the end of history. It's going to happen for all of us. Some of us will have to lay in the grave longer than she did. But there'll be some who never lay in the grave one day. I want to thank His Grace and all of you for coming. Um, this is just kind of an introduction. This will happen tomorrow. So tomorrow morning we have a service at uh, 9 o'clock and then followed by wonderful uh, hours on reflection on Holy Week. So we encourage you to come tomorrow. God bless you. Thank you. We pray. Sing one of the um, it's the oldest known hymn to the Virgin Mary. Um, a scrap of it, we sing it all the time in the church, it's not an unusual thing. When you hear it, you'll be surprised that it's the oldest known hymn to the Virgin Mary. It's one of the oldest known Christian hymns. This, a scrap of it has been the church has always known that we didn't need the archaeologists to find an Egyptian papyrus. But they found a scrap of Egyptian papyrus that they can date to the second century. And part of this hymn is on the scraps of the whole hymn is in there. When's the second century? We're talking about the one out of the And so it's heard. It's much older than Old World of the Cross and what it turned out to be. This is an old hymn. An old hymn of Christians of that first generation after the apostles knew and already sang to the mother of God. And we sing it like every night at Vespers during Lent and many other times. And the choir and those things, not to this melody, but they sing it to the Russian melody. <clears throat> Beneath thy compassion we take refuge, O Theotokos. Despise not our
that would be real good. Um, we look for, and Father Bates will really search the entire complex, the altar, the chapel, the Sunday school rooms, for the icon of the raising of Lazarus, which I wanted to be the other icon here so I could point something out. I couldn't find it. It's here someplace, but we just don't know where. Um, so we'll pretend that it's up here on the table. Before I begin the discussion of uh, Holy Week, are there any comments about last night? I mean, did you have to mull anything or chew anything or straighten anything out in your minds last night? Yes, ma'am. I checked the book out the library last night, and I could not get a page. The Life of the Virgin Mary? Yes. Isn't it great? I read a Someone, and I know who she was, she's a nun named Mother Money from Colorado, uh, who gathered all of the various traditions concerning the life of the Mother of God from all the sources, all of the first the scripture, the fathers, the liturgical text, uh, the synaxaria, just folk traditions. Everything, everything, everything is in that book. And it's well written. The life of the uh, Virgin Mary that will Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us about the icon you had uh, last night? Yeah, it was an, an unusual one, wasn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Because it was the Mother of God by herself, standing like this, which means that it's a part of a set. And that's why the Christ child was not in her arm. You know, we have this mistaken rule church that we never see the Virgin Mary in an icon without the Christ child. And that's sort of an old wives tale. It's not true. Uh, for instance, we see the Virgin Mary in the Annunciation. The Christ child is not there. Uh, we see the Virgin Mary in the icon of her nativity. The Christ child is not there. She's not born yet. Uh, so that's a fallacy. That's an old wives tale that has been passed on by Sunday school teachers to the gullible students like me. But for generations. Uh, but Every icon of the Mother of God, whether she is with the Christ child or without the Christ child, um, in, every icon implies his presence. First by, well, it's not here then, so I can't tell you. But the next time you look at any icon of the Mother of God, look at her forehead and her two shoulders. Even as a child, even before Christ was born, look at those three stars, or sometimes like a cross or like an asterisk. You'll see like on her forehead, uh, the veil, excuse me, the forehead, uh, the veil at her forehead, and the veil at each of her shoulders. Those three stars, or sunbursts, um, are there even when she's an infant, if you can see an icon of her nativity, she's laying in a cradle. Those three stars indicate that she, in that instance, will be, and certainly after when she's holding the Christ child, remains a virgin before birth and during birth. And after birth, you know, after she gave birth to a Christ child, she was still a virgin. So those three stars indicate something about her relationship with him, even when he's not in the icon. Like in the Annunciation, where it would be impossible for Christ's child to be in the icon of the Annunciation. He wasn't born. Or in her nativity. Or in the icon of her presentation or entrance into the temple. When she was three years old, look at her. And she looks like a little... Virgin Mary. I mean, it looks like the tall Virgin Mary and the adult Virgin Mary. She's dressed the same, but only in miniature form. And each time she has those three stars. It's not to make the sign of the cross. It's not that. It's indicating that she was and is and shall always remain a virgin before birth and during birth and after birth, during those three different stages. The icon last night is from a set. Um, and sometimes it's all painted on one panel. Or sometimes it's on several panels. Last night we only had one panel icon of the Virgin Mary. And it's of a scene or depiction that's called the Beasis, or the icon of supplication. Uh, if you, you've been to the cathedral, if, if those of you who have been to the cathedral can remember, up above the iconostas, on the wall behind the iconostas, you have that huge icon of the Virgin Mary, Platitera, more spacious than the heavens. And I'll tell you why she's there in a second. 
But above that, all the way up to the ceiling of the arch, is an icon, a depiction, a fresco of the day's supplication. It has Christ sitting on a throne in the center. And then to his right is an icon of the Mother of God making supplication to him like this. And that's what that was last night. Okay, it was only the bust. The cathedral is full length. You see the Mother of God standing like this. And on his other side, you see John the Baptist standing like this. Then we have different saints, St. Basil, and St. John, St. Catherine, St. Barbara, Mary of Egypt. Each one on each side, they're standing in supplication to Christ like this. So although she was alone, I mean, that was an attitude of supplication, and it's a supplication towards Christ. What also is always present on her icon, beside those three stars, is the designation. It looks like an M and a P, and this circle with a line through it, and it looks like a Y. Those are Greek letters. Uh, and it stands for Mother of God. The M and the P, like an English-looking P in Greek, is an R. So that's the first and last letters of Mite, Mother. It works in English, too, doesn't it? M and R. Except it comes out Mr. <laughs> uh, M and R. And then on the other side, that circle with a line through it, is a Greek letter that has the sound of a th, a th. And the thing that looks like a y is really two letters. It's an o and a u joined together. That's the first and the last letters of the Greek word of God, theu. <coughs> so it's niter theu. You'll notice that on every icon of the mother of God, whether she's an infant, a child, uh, an adult with Christ, without Christ, uh, there's always that inscription, looks like Mr. Thu, M-R-P-H-O-U. Uh, if we would do it in English, it would be M-R and G-D, which is also not so good in English. Um, and they have a little like a, a squirrel at the top of it. Right? That indicates that this letter is missing. So if you have, oh good. And it can either look like this, or it can look like there's some kind of design on the top. That little squiggly over the top tells you that that's not a word, that's an abbreviation. And that there are letters missing in between. And the letters that are missing would be Those are eyes, those H's are eyes in Greek. Meteor. Mother of God. So what they did, they took the first letter and the last letter and put them in squiggly. The first letter, and they combined these two last letters here with a squiggly. There's other things like this, watch. Nika is a word 
That's why there's no squiggly zone. NIKA is one word. So that's not an abbreviation. And that's why you see squigglies here, but not here. And if you see squigglies over the NIKA, it's wrong, because it's not an abbreviation. Why did I do that? Okay, every icon, not just of the Mother of God, but every icon, if it's an authentic icon, has a designation on it who it is. If you see an icon without a designation, like the saint's name on it. That means the person who painted the icon didn't know what they were doing or they forgot. Because for it to be a proper icon, for you to venerate it, you have to know who you're venerating. And even if you think that looks to be Christ, and we can recognize icon of Christ, right? Even without his designation. Or the mother of God. Um, the iconographer is bound to put a designation on the icon so that we don't, in ignorance, venerate something we don't know what it is. That's why the clues are on there. So meet them too. And her designate her attitude implied his presence. That's a part of the set of actions. Any other questions about the mother of God? Or, yes, ma'am. Uh, conquers or is victorious. So it would be Jesus Christ, an abbreviation. That would be lawful to write out Jesus Christos. Jesus Christ is victorious or Jesus Christ conquers. And that's, uh, you know that statue, Winged Victory? You know, it's that ancient Greek, I think it's Greek, not Rome, ancient Greek statue. It has no head, but a, it's a beautiful thing with wings. And it's called Winged Victory. In Greek, the name of that statue is Niki, Victory. Uh, someone who conquers is a victory. It's like the girl's name, Niki. Or the man's name, Niko Laos. Laos in Greek means people. So that would be the, the victory of the people, or the, the, uh, the people are victorious, or the victor of the people, like a hero or Nicola Snickers. Any other question? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, Dave. Uh, no, they should be inscribed in a language that the people understand. Uh, until recently, don't forget, we did not have like homegrown iconographers here in America. And if we did, there were people who moved here from other countries. Um, in, in Russia, the icons are all inscribed in Slavonic. In Greece and in many other places, the inscriptions are in Greek. Uh, but if we're in America, and the idea is to identify who the icon, who's in the icon, it's proper that it be in English. It doesn't have to be. However, most iconographers continue, even if it's in America or in Japan or Finland, for Christ and the Mother of God, they usually continue those traditional designations of Jesus Christos on each side of Christ, the head of Christ, and on each side of the Mother of God, that Niter Theo. Even in Russia, they kept that in Greek, Jesus Christos and Niter Theo. Sometimes in Arabic and in English now, you'll see there's no more Niter Theo and Jesus Christos. They'll write it in Arabic. And sometimes in English, rarely. Sometimes you'll see. One more question. If Father Constantine was able, um, and sometimes we won't do it now, but during the break, Father Constantine you know, was from the Holy Land, like some of you, um, and has visited there many times, found a video of when he made pilgrimage to the home of Joachim and Anna, uh, where the Mother of God was born. And it's a, a chapel, it's maintained as a shrine, uh, Greek Orthodox, and where people can go and pray. So he brought the video, so if you'd like to see that, Tomorrow. That's where Anna was praying when the Archangel Gabriel came and told her that she would bear the child. And where she and uh, Job had been conceived the Mother of God, where she was raised until she was three and then taken to the temple. And Father, it's not far from Zion, right? From the temple mount. That was blocks even. Not even. So they walked her to the temple and left her when she was three as a gift of God.
No. Her question, can I repeat your question so they can all hear it, or do you want to scream? No, I don't. I just, uh, I, I, last night I called a person. Uh, uh, oh, uh -huh. Oh, I was a believer. Sure. Moral Bible church. Sure. And asked her, and I was curious when she responded, like I responded to what I mean in that instance, as the King of Artists talks to what I was doing. Exactly. To the team. So, but neither one of us, uh, I don't, I don't know. Okay, her question was about the Immaculate Conception, which, as I said last night, when they did a survey among Roman Catholics, most of them thought it had to do with Mary conceiving Christ in the womb. Most of them. And that's not what the Immaculate Conception is. Immaculate Conception is the conception of Mary in the womb of Anna. And remember that song of Bernadette, that old black and white movie? where the Virgin Mary supposedly appeared in the garbage dump. That was what was so interesting. In Lourdes, in France. She identified herself, and if you see medals of you know, Our Lady of Lourdes, it says, I am the Immaculate Conception. So it has to do with her. It doesn't have to do with Christ at all. The Immaculate Conception has to do with her. Her question was, was theologically, was that one of the differences between the Eastern Church and the Western Church that led to the Schism in the 11th century. Is that correct? That's your question. The answer is no. The reason is that was not defined as a dogma of the Roman Catholic Church. And a dogma is something you have to believe. It's like God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you don't believe that, well, you can't be a Christian, or at least not an Orthodox Christian. That's a dogma. That Jesus Christ was God and man, perfect God and perfect man. That's a dogma. That's not up for debate. Some could believe it, some can't believe it. That's a dog. Now there are some things in the church you can believe or not believe. And that's about the bodily assumption of the mother of God into heaven. The church teaches it, but we don't teach it as a dogma. If you don't want to believe that, you can still go to heaven. You'll be surprised when you get there because your body's there. <laughs> but it's not something that your salvation depends upon. Dog dogma means revealed truth that your salvation depends upon your believing. Okay? So, the Immaculate Conception was not defined as a dogma of the Roman Catholic Church until the 19th century, the 1800s. But as I said last night, it was a logical progression, a logical conclusion of an error that was made a long time in Western theology, made beginning in the 4th century. Good question. When the Bible was translated from Greek into Latin, and it was, it's called the Vulgate. Perhaps you've heard that the Vulgate translation. It sounds bad, it doesn't mean anything Vulgate. <laughs> vulgar, the word vulgar in its root in Latin simply means common. It doesn't mean bad. When we say someone made a, a vulgar comment, it usually means off color or bad. That's not its original meaning. It simply meant that it's the common. Way. So St. Jerome translated the Greek Bible, and he's a St. Trust in Jerome, translated the Greek Bible, the New Testament was authored in Greek, into the common Latin, not a high Latin. It was so that everyone could understand it. That's all the Vulgate means. In the Epistle to the Romans, St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, there is, I believe it's I'm on video, so I, I'm going to try not to make a mistake, but I can't promise. I think it's the fifth chapter, the twelfth verse, or the twelfth chapter, the fifth verse, I forget. It's one of those numbers. Where St. Paul speaks about Adam's sin and its effect on mankind. Okay. What it says in the scripture, can I borrow a Bible? This one will be precise. Forgive me, okay, a little break here until I find it. Because this is important, first and foremost for you, and secondly because others might see this. Romans 5.12, let me try that. This is, I'm trying to remember from my seminary day. I got it, it's Romans 5.12. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and that one man being Adam, right? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and by death sin, and so
so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Okay? Very clear. You can get it if you want me to repeat it one more time. Sin came into the world by one man, and the result of sin is death. And so death passed to all men because all men have sinned. Okay? When that was translated from Greek into Latin, the English is cool when it's right. When it was translated from Greek into Latin, it implied, very well, it didn't imply, it said very clearly that all men sinned in Adam. In Adam. That when Adam sinned, all of his descendants sinned. <coughs> Let me see if I can even read what it would say in Latin. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and by death sin came into the world, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. There's a preposition there in the Latin. And it meant in whom all sin. By Adam's fallen, we all sin. We were all guilty of the sin. It's Two prepositional phrases. Since y'all don't read Greek, I'll write, write the Greek words but in English letters. F O. Saint Jerome translated it into Latin. In quote, in whom all sin. And that makes a big difference. A huge difference. That means that we are all born sinners because we all sinned in Adam. That's what they mean by original sin. That everybody is born, not just born, you're conceived a sinner because all of Adam's descendants are sinners because we all, generic mankind, sin in Adam. When he sinned, we all sin. Without, that's an important thing to understand. Orthodoxy does not teach that. Orthodoxy teaches, and always has, what's here. And what's here is that what came into the world because of Adam's sin was death, not guilt for that sin. That's what scripture says. Adam sinned, and death was introduced into the world. Okay? Not guilt for sin. We all did not sin in Adam. We all sinned. But Adam's responsible for his own sin, and we're responsible for our own sin. What was the result of Adam's sin and Eve's, by their disobedience, was that death, corruption and death entered into the world. So that we are born not sinners. We're not sinners when we're born. As infants. We can only be sinners by our own volition by our own acts, by our own deeds or our own thoughts. But what we are born is mortal. It's like a sickness, and that's how Orthodoxy and her fathers have always seen sin, not as an infraction of the law. And you become a criminal, guilty, and therefore deserving of punishment. That's not what Orthodoxy has ever, that's not what Christianity taught. And Orthodoxy never has taught. What orthodoxy teaches is that sin is an illness. It's an illness from which we can be healed. But like any illness, it has its effects. And the effects are not punishment for breaking the law. They are the effects of illness. If you have diabetes and you leave it untreated, I'm speaking of that because my grandfather had it and my mother. If you leave it untreated, you can become blind. You can lose limbs. That's not a punishment. God doesn't say you have diabetes and you're not watching your diet. I'm going to punish you and make you blind. It's a result of sin. A, a, a result of the illness, right? And you can end up on dialysis. That's just an unfortunate result of the illness. Death is a result of sin. It's not a punishment. For sin. So what we are born, we're all born with the results of Adam's sin. We're born mortal. We're born corruptible. Mankind was taken from the earth by God. It was not 
his intention that we be dissolved back into the earth. He didn't create us for us to die. That's a result of that sin, which is now an illness and it's spread to all of Adam's descendants. It's an illness that is, what's an illness that's passed on from generation to generation? It's a hereditary illness. We're born with it. We're not responsible for it. So there's no guilt associated with it. But in Latin, and that affected the whole Latin church, the whole Latin-speaking church, which was the West. And it didn't happen all at one time. Okay, they, they worked from their Bibles, their theologies developed. It's developed a little bit like this. And if you start just a wee little bit off, you want to draw a, a parallel line, but once it's a little bit off, after time, after distance, you can be miles off. Just absolutely miles apart from one little mistake. This little mistake caused the whole Western church to go on a ride in its theology. A very important part of its theology is not tradition about something. This is about God's relationship with man and how man relates to God. By the time we got to St. Augustine, and he's also a saint for us, he theologized the whole concept of original sin. And because he was the main father of the Western Church, uh, they had others, but the East was very rich at that time in fathers. So we don't base all of our theology on one. We have a lot you know, at that time. But he was the primary father of the Western Church. So, so much was based on his theology. And he's the father, if you want to say, of it's the Western Church's understanding of original sin that everybody's born with. You are born a sinner. Now let's take now some logical conclusions of that. A baby who is born is guilty of sin. Okay? It's guilty of sin. We're talking, this is not orthodoxy, okay? Everybody here, wake up if you're, I'm not going to speak as an orthodox in the next couple minutes. St. Augustine and the Western Church, it's a logical conclusion then from this mistranslation that every, all humanity ever to be born sinned in Adam and therefore is guilty of Adam's sin. Um, a child who is born and is not baptized. How about that? Can't go to heaven. Because it is a depraved sinner. And St. Augustine, as I said, it was not just an illness. It wasn't an illness at all. It was a crime. That wasn't a move that you just sort of tipped off the table. You fell all the way down to the basement. You are a completely depraved sinner. And the only thing that can help you is not your will. Nothing, 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 nothing. God's grace. And if he calls you, it ended up in Calvinism. God calls some for salvation, and he predestines some for hell. It has nothing to do with you at all. It has all to do with God. So how do people end up in hell? Well, God must predestine some people for hell. And you see all of these warped, logical conclusions. They all don't belong to Roman Catholicism. That one belongs to Calvinism. That grew out of Roman Catholicism, okay? Out of Western theology. So if a baby is born a sinner just as guilty as Adam, not a little bit more or a little bit less, exactly as guilty as Adam, and he was cast out of paradise, and he was going to work and earn his sweat by the bread of his, the sweat of his brow. He's going to go back to the earth and die. All of these things. That little baby, who was maybe only three seconds old, drew a breath and then died, is as guilty a sinner as Adam was in paradise. But what does a merciful God do? Well, we can't let him into heaven. That would make God a whip. Doesn't work that way. But we can't believe that God's going to send him to hell. So where are we going to send him? Limbo. Purgatory is for somebody. A limbo is for unbaptized babies. It's not heaven, and it's certainly not hell. So we will say, well, limbo means like in between. There's some place, but that's where unbaptized babies go. We don't believe in limbo. Okay. If everybody is born this depraved sinner, and the only way you can be washed of that sin is through baptism. Okay? And for baptism, for us, it's not just the washing away of sins. It's adoption as a son.
son or daughter of God, it's death and resurrection. It's much more of baptism than the Lord does. But the only way that that terrible sin can be washed away from that innocent little baby is by baptism. If you don't baptize that baby, well, then it's not going to happen. Who baptized the Virgin Mary? <clears throat> was there a baptism before the Annunciation? No, there wasn't a baby. So that meant that she was this depraved sinner that God, who was all pure, united with to give birth to her son. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense to us or to them. I mean, he chose her. She's blessed, um, um, highly favored among all women. For what? For her purity, for a, a body and a mind and a spirit. So she must have been conceived differently from her. She was not baptized. And if through the sex act, and that's what happened in the West, and that's why they ended up with Victorianism, with sex is bad, we don't talk about it, and God forbid even married couples shouldn't even enjoy it. I mean, it's something we have to endure. And the only thing that even makes it a little bit good is that children are born. And if no children are born, then it's just, you know, de depravity. We act like animals. I mean, it's a bad thing, absolutely bad thing, because that's how sin is passed on. You see? Sin is passed on through the sex act. So, Adam, I mean, excuse me, Joachim and Anna, we know, as any husband and wife, were together so that she might be conceived. How was the mother of God, though, spared from becoming this depraved sinner? God zapped at the moment when the sperm was going to meet the egg, evidently, and there was a special grace given at that moment that preserved the transmission of sin. Everything else was transmitted, but not sin. Well, that makes her very different to you. That was clearly defined in the 1800s. Yeah. And that's what my grandparents did. I don't know about y'all. That's not that long ago in my remembrance. For the church, that's like yesterday. Okay? It was clearly defined as a dogma in the 19th century. But you see what that does? That removes her from the rest of mankind. Her humanity is different than mine. And if her humanity is different, where did our Lord get his humanity from? from her. So our Lord's humanity is different than my humanity. And how can my humanity then be redeemed? St. Paul tells us in this book from the Bible this is not some father that quoted it or this is from the Bible that he, Jesus Christ, became like us in all things except sin. That's the only way he's different. He became sin for us, but he was not a sinner. So that was defined in the 19th century, that she was not a sinner, that she was immaculately conceived. No sin was involved in her conception. It was by a special act of God, special grace. But, I mean, how does that elevate her? You know, she who couldn't sin, what's so great about her not sinning? You know, we say she remained sinless, by her will, something all of us can do. It takes a lot of struggle. And I don't know that anybody's going to attain it, you know, really. But she, in those sins that require will, in some sins we do not with knowledge. You know, see, what, she wasn't free of those sins. We're not saying she was sinless, spotless like Christ. But any sin that required one's agreement, one's decision to sin, uh, she was free from that. By her own will. She's God's grace first and foremost, but she cooperated with God. The same thing you and I can do. Now that's great. That's great. If she was able in every instance of her entire life to remain sinless by God's grace and her will, I mean, she deserves to be hailed as everything under the sun. But if she couldn't sin, what's the big deal? You see, it denigrates her. It doesn't elevate her. Let's look at the next logical What's the result of sin? The wages of sin is death. If you're not a sinner, you don't die unless you voluntarily submit to death like Christ did on the cross. 
It was spotless. He did not have to die. If he lived to be an old man and there was no God, God forbid, he would never have died. The wages of sin is death. How about the mother of God? Did she die? Well, let's put on the cap if we're still on the stimulant over here. If she was born without any sin, I mean, without the possibility of sin, and she never sinned, she didn't die. She didn't die. And there was another dogma. The Roman Catholic Church is called the dogma of the Assumption. Now we call the Assumption the same thing. First of all, like I said last she died. Then she, like us, then she was raised from the dead and bodily taken to the kingdom. And that's not all that different. It's not different at all from what's going to happen to us except in the length of time she spent in the grave. Okay, it doesn't make her superhuman or different from us. But according to this other theology, if she's not a sinner, no, she's not a sinner. If she was conceived differently than the rest of us, and that meant she's not even carrying the disease called death. That means she didn't have to die, and she didn't. Rather than dying, she was bodily assumed in the heaven without dying. Now go figure that out. Tell me that's not different than me and you. Even our Lord died. That's the dogma of the bodily assumption of the Mother of God that was defined as dogma in 1952. I was alive then. But you see how it's the logical conclusion of the Immaculate Conception, which is the logical conclusion of somebody being guilty in Adam from that mistranslation. But if you exempt her from that guilt, which also exempts her from death, because in here, that's the result of sin is death. If you exempt her from that, you end up with somebody who didn't die. Or if she did die, and now some modern Roman Catholics will say, she did die, but it was because she willed to be like she wanted to be like us. But it's not, that's even a little bit more hokey, I think, than just being honest and saying, well, she didn't. Okay. One more thing that I, I promise we'll get into the Holy Week, but this is preparatory to Holy Week. Because it all has to do, what did our Lord accomplish by his suffering and death and resurrection? What did he accomplish for us by that? It has to do with what we're talking about now. Some of you, most of you, perhaps not all of you, have heard of the atonement, the whole doctrine of the atonement. Okay, and especially in Protestantism, or Orthodox who are familiar with Protestant Bible studies. If you're Orthodox like me from your cradle, or from your font baptism as an infant, you might not have heard of it, or if you heard of it, you never understood it like the West means it. Okay? The atonement means that someone had to pay the debt for us being sinners. Okay? Someone had to pay that. We couldn't pay it on our own. All of humanity, all however many billions of us, from Adam until the end of the world, no matter what all hundred billion of us would ever have done, we could not have paid the debt for our sin. It was impossible for humanity to do that. So the Son of God came, and He paid that debt. It, I'm, I'm copacetic with that. The church is copacetic with that. It was necessary for Him to come. Unfortunately, He had to come. But he came, and we thank him for that. But it has to do with why. Why? Let's go now to the West. Again, all from this messed up translation. It's because sin is a crime. It's not an illness. It's a crime against God. And God's justice requires that there be some atonement for that offense. It's like our civil law. You do the crime, you pay the time. Um, there might be circumstances that say your time is, can be mitigated, but you have to do something, even if it's only you know, being probation. You do the crime, you pay the time. And in the West, because sin is considered a crime and an affront to God, an insult to his justice is offended. 
and his justice must be, um, what's the word I want? Somebody help me. A switch, thank you. It must somehow, okay? All of us, from Adam until that last baby born of our Lord, starting to come down from heaven, billions of human beings could have, I don't know, nailed ourselves to the cross and poured out all our blood, and it would not have satisfied God's justice. That's the word I was looking for. God's justice must have satisfaction. And human beings were incapable of doing it either individually or corporately. Okay? But his justice must be satisfied. And there's only one way that that justice can be satisfied, and that is by the blood of the Son of God. He who is sinless comes and redeems and by his blood atones or pays for all of our sins and God's justice then is satisfied. Does that sound like you get it so far? That's an awful God. It's an absolutely awful God who can only be said. He is so angry Okay? He's so angry that he can only be appeased by the blood of his only begotten son. So that debt, that price for us, is paid to the Father. The Son pays it to the Father. And that is absolutely awful. St. Gregory the Theologian even understood then in the 4th century that some people were understanding it in that way. And he said, God forbid... <coughs> That our God should be such a bloodthirsty God. I mean, I would rather have a God who was satisfied by the blood of bulls and oxen and sheep, like in the Old Testament, than this God who says, heck with sheep, I want my son's blood. That's the only thing that's going to satisfy my justice. And once he does that, I'm fine. I'm, I love you, you love me, but he, I need his blood. That's awful. And the fathers of the church, especially greater than they were, and said, God forbid that that's what God should be about. But that's the doctrine of the atonement that's in the Western church. And most especially, not so much the Roman Catholic Church, although it's there. But that is certainly Calvinism. And everybody, every group that ever came out of Calvinism, that's certainly in the Baptist church. And I know that for a fact. Because when I was preaching one time, I was ignorant of that. I couldn't Never even dawned on me that somebody would want to call a God like that father. You know, that's an abusive father for that sake. You know, look what he did to his own son. It's going to do to me. I preached one time about what I'm going to talk about soon. And this Baptist seminary professor was there with some of his parishioners. He was retired. Now, this was in Fort Collins, Colorado. And he came up, and I'm sure if he had the stake in fire, he would burn me at the stake for being a heretic. Because I never mention that God's justice must be satisfied. I talk about God as love and mercy and uh, redeeming and His grace is free and He gives us the gift of eternal life as a free gift. All of these wonderful things that you have. That's what the Bible tells me. He was so offended. Really, He would have tied me to a stake and burned me as a heretic because God, justice, must be satisfied. And the only way it could be satisfied was by the Son of God. And if you don't believe that, Bishop Basil, you're not even a Christian. You know, there's a wonderful quote from St. Isaac the Syrian that we heard last week at the uh, clergy symposium in Wichita. Bishop Elavio was a specialist in Isaac the Syrian was there. Now he would have been the 7th century I mean, Baptists have had a lot of time to read what the early Christians believed, that they would just take the time. Just put this book away just for one second to see what the Christians understood this book to mean. Okay? Not by itself, but what did they understand it to mean? St. Isaac said this, and this is certainly the position of the church throughout the centuries until this whole warped doctrine of the atonement appeared in the West. St. Isaac said this. Let me get it right now. from his 51st homily, spiritual homily, in Isaac the Syrian. As a grain of sand 
cannot counterbalance a great quantity of gold. So likewise, the justice which God uses cannot counterbalance his mercy. I love it. I'm a sinner, that's why I love it. But it's also true. I'll say it again. And if I get it wrong, it's in St. Isaac of Syria's Spiritual Homilies, number 51. As a grain of sand cannot counterbalance a great quantity of gold, so likewise, the justice which God uses cannot counterbalance his mercy. There's a couple things to look at. Number one, we call mercy God's. It's one of his attributes. It belongs to him. We don't say God's justice. We say the justice that God uses. And that's very different. You see, when there's justice, that means there's rules and laws that you have to observe. God is not bound by anything. If he was bound by anything, he wouldn't be God. That's, that's what God, he's the law giver. He's above all laws. Yeah, there's somebody above the law, and it's God. So justice is not a part of his essence. It's not a part of who he is. Mercy is. And that's why St. Isaac can say God's mercy. But he didn't say God's justice. He said, so likewise, the justice which God uses cannot counterbalance his mercy. And that's, as I said, that's what the church has always believed. That's what scripture means when it says, when it says God is love. That's of his essence. And mercy belongs with love. Justice doesn't. Justice doesn't belong. You have to do justice. Okay, justice is required sometimes. But certainly not. When I go to the judgments, when I go to the court here, okay, IRS calls me in to get audited. I want justice, because I know I was right, and I ended up being right, more right than they thought. I didn't take all my deductions I could have taken. So if we go to court here, we want justice. When I go to the judgment seat, I don't want justice at all. I want mercy. Because if it's justice, I am a sinner. And I am undeserving of anything except condemnation. It's not my desire. IRS, IRS didn't say, do you desire to pay your taxes. Did you desire to defraud us? I mean, they don't care about your desire or your motivation. They care about the action, what you did. That's justice. It's black and it's white and that's it. You do the crime, you pay the time. I did no crime, so I'd have to pay anything. Pay me. But mercy is, yes, you are, yes, you're the worst of sinners. But I know you love me. I know you desire this. I know you desire I and mean, even St. Paul says, you know, I, I want to do something and my body stops me. I don't want to sin. But my body causes me to sin or he uses some kind of an excuse, you know. I, I don't do what I want to do even. That's mercy. And atonement and mercy don't go together. Is there a question before I take this to hold you because it's a natural signal? Yes, no, no, please. Can I read it? You certainly can. Yes, you can. Um, from Romans 3, 25. Yes. God presented them to Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his Son. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he elected to be the Lord of the flesh. Yes. So, help me. It's very easy. God uses justice because justice is right. Because I said it's not a part of his
But his justice cannot be out, his, his mercy cannot be outweighed by his justice. When it comes down to it, and that means to something important. Not that I'm going to chase you in this earth, you know, slap you around and make you know, so that you can wake up and become a holy person. But when it comes to your salvation, God's justice will always be tempered by his mercy. Let's look just at the second atonement and we'll answer this question. Because it has to do with what was accomplished by Christ's death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection. What was the whole point of this incarnation of Christ? We were born with an illness, which is called sin. We go to a priest not as to a judge and confess our crime. And that's why we don't kneel like in front of him. He stands next to us, and we're both in front of the icon of Christ. He's our advocate there. We go there to say how sick we are by going to a doctor. And he, to whom has been given by the grace of the all Holy Spirit, the power to do sins or to retain sins, prescribe the medicine for our healing. And those are the penances that we give Now we use the same words that they use in the West, but we mean entirely different things. The sin that you confess does not have a fixed in a book someplace where this sin requires this punishment. So this is the penance that's given you. This is your illness. And I'm your doctor, which is an art, an art form. I don't give the same medicine to everybody who has a heart problem. The cardiologists don't do that. We can go to the drugstore. I have a heart problem, I want that given to me. They prescribe individually for the um, symptom which we confess. And that's why we can't be ashamed to confess anything. It's not a crime that we willfully did. It's something that we in our body did as a result of being ill with sin. So don't be ashamed. You know, the doctor can't help you. If you don't tell him, if you just go in and say, I'm sick. If you go to confession and say, Father, forgive me, I'm a sinner. We know that. <laughs> I mean, how can we prescribe any medicine? That's a given. We know that. My grandmother, not my sister, my other grandmother, never went to the doctor until she got to be about 87 years old. She was always very proud of that. And when she went, she went angry. And the doctor said, well, Mrs. Luna, what's the matter? Said I heard. He said, "Where?" And she said, "You're the doctor. <laughs> I'm paying you, and you tell me." She was angry. I mean, she didn't get much help until she was a little bit more specific. Then I heard. He realized that. Well, that's why you're here. So too it is with our sins. That the more specific we are, and we live in a, in a culture perhaps that makes us guilty or ashamed of our sins. That's silly. People with cancer aren't ashamed to have cancer in society. Uh, if we're blind, you can't be ashamed and pretend you're not blind. I don't want anybody to know I'm blind. You're blind. It's not your fault. So too with sin. Um, that the prescription that's given to us, that our, our penance is given to us for our healing. Okay? But there's one thing that we cannot heal, and that's its ultimate end, which is Death came in as an enemy to mankind, and it's not according to God's will. He can make the best of it, but we were not created to die. We call God a life giver, not a death bringer. Kind of good. He created us to live and to live forever. And he told us how to do it. Back there in that garden of delight in paradise, he told Adam and Eve how to do it. Enjoy all of this. Absolutely all of it. Just refrain from this one tree. There's a lot of other trees. There's a lot of other beautiful fruit. Just, just don't eat that one. They were tempted. She was tempted to them and he was tempted. And they did. And death entered in. Because they separated themselves from God. That was the one who breathed life into them. He's the one who sustained life in them. It's like a lamp. No, we're not even talking about an inanimate object. 
It's someone who is on life support, and they just reach over and unplug themselves from the life support. They die. Because they're not connected to that which was keeping them alive. Sin separates us from God. Death enters in. And God is faced now with this. The king and queen of his creation, the most precious thing that was ever created, the things that he loves, the creatures for which everything else was created, have turned their back on him. And he's faced with this. He loves them. And he sees that what they did causes them now to return to the earth from which they were taken. We can read in the book of Genesis several ways, or two ways, how these words might be spoken. This is after they sinned, right? And they heard the voice of the Lord God who was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That's God who is the Father, Son, and the Spirit. It's God the Son. That's Jesus here before he was incarnate. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Because they sinned, right? They disobeyed. Him. And the Lord God, this is beautiful, called out unto Adam and said unto him, Adam, where art thou? He's God, he knows. But he loves him. He says, where art thou? You can read it that way if you want. Adam, where are you? It's not how the fathers of the church understand it. It's like with sadness. You know, we did this every day since I created you. We walked and talked in this garden. You know, the best part of the day while it's cool. Where, where, where are you? And Adam said, I'm in Genesis 3, by the way, 310, if you want to follow it. And Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he, God said, who told thee that thou wast naked? One can also do that in an angry voice if you want. Some people do, we don't. Who told thee that thou wast naked? How hast thou eaten of the tree where have I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with thee, she gave me the tree, and I didn't eat. The Lord God said unto the woman, What is this thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat it. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, the serpent is Satan, right, in the guise of a snake. Thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Etc., etc., verse 15, 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be for thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. You didn't listen to me, you listen to your wife. And to the wife he said, You didn't listen to me, you listen to the serpent. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Not cursed is the ground for thy sake. He's stating a fact. Sisters and a couple brothers who are here. He's simply stating a fact. Almost as the fathers would have us readers weeping. Weeping. You know, now, y'all just didn't disobey me and you're going to have problems. The ground is cursed. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou be with it all the days of thy life. Stating the fact. Not cursing him. Who was cursed? Was Satan. Adam and Eve were not cursed by God. Adam and Eve heard from God the results of their sin. And if you read it with a gentle voice, and the father would when he sees that he just can't help his son anymore, or his daughter, you understand really how the church understands you understand how the churches always understand God's relationship to be with man. He's not an angry tyrant who's out to punish people. You know, I did everything I could for you. I asked you to just avoid one thing, and you listen to somebody else, and now let me tell you what's going to be resolved. It's going to happen. I mean, fathers and mothers can tell their children, don't walk 
out in the street, don't cross the street without looking both ways. And if a child gets hit by a car, God forbid, that's not the punishment. If the parents, you didn't listen to me, hope that car comes and he's going to kill you. No, that's right. That's, we don't tolerate that in humanity. Why should we tolerate that in a God who we believe and call Father? He goes on and he says, verse 18, Thorns also and thistles shall it the earth bring forth to me. For thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Again, it's not a curse because you did this. It's going to bring thorns and thistles, and you're going to eat herbs. You've got to eat all this wonderful stuff in paradise. Now you're going to eat herbs. I mean, it's awful. <laughs> and in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. That I means you're going to have to labor hard to eat that. While you were in paradise, I took care of you. Everything was, you could just walk around, eat what you want, drink what you want. It's all for you. But now, just to get bread, you're going to have to do it by the sweat of your brow. Again, you hear me? You hear the difference? It's not because you did this, you're going to have to eat your bread by the sweat of your brow. It's now you do it. This is what's going to happen. And this is the worst part. Verse 19, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. And this must have broken God's heart. If we can anthropomorphize God. Thou shalt eat the sweat of thy face. Thou shalt, excuse me, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art. And unto dust shalt thou shalt eat. I mean, that's heartbreaking. You know, I took you from us. I breathed my own spirit into you. And I told you what not to do because I knew it would be dangerous. Not because I said something there as a test to see if you would obey me. It's dangerous for you to eat that now. I ask you not to eat that now. But you see, now I can't help you anymore. You're going to go back from where and that's heartbreaking. I didn't create you to go back to the dust. I believe God got his hands, if you want to answer the horse, huh? God got his hands dirty. He got dirt under his fingernails in order to create Adam and Eve. And now he sees all his work. Everything he created was for Adam and Eve. And they blew it. Every, all of his labors. And we can do this in our own families, perhaps, or our neighbors' families. We work hard and hard and hard for our sons and we build up things and for our daughters and wealth and good reputation and I don't know what, they do drugs and get in a car wreck and die. And everything, we, everything we worked for was for them, it wasn't for us. God didn't create heaven and earth for himself, he didn't need it. It was for us. So if you can see the sadness in Genesis, not the justice you did this crime, and now you're going to pay. This is the payment for your crime. Now, what kind of a God is that? Why did he create up? What parent would say that to a child? They're laying paraplegic in the hospital. You go in, he said, it's your fault. I did all of this for you. Suffer. And now you're going to die. You're going to go back to the earth. Everything I did for you. I mean, that, what would be, that's an abusive father, right? That father deserves to be put in prison. And his son, whether he's guilty and did something bad or not, does not deserve to hear that from a parent. That's not how parents relate to children. And sisters, that's not how our God relates to us. It's not. I know around here you have a lot of big churches where preachers scream out of this Bible and bang this Bible and point fingers and threats and read these same words, almost delighting in anger. I hear it on the radio. I see it on TV. And I say, why do they have 7,000 people? Why would they go and want to hear that? First of all, it's a lie. But even if it was true, I would rather be an atheist than believe in a God of God. I would want nothing to do with that kind of a God. And they go by the tens of thousands. Right here in Oklahoma City. You know, those huge churches they go. And in many of them, not all of them, and many of them, they hear that screaming, yelling, and angry thing. So we have, where are we now? We have Adam and Eve outside of paradise. Being warned 
by God. Uh, what they're going to find out, they look like little children who are always protected in that garden of delight in paradise. God's saying, now you're going out. Uh, you have to. I don't want you to, but you have to. That's, you're going to end up there anyway because you turned your back. That's what, the direction you're going. I'm going to warn you what you're going to find out there. And this is what you're going to find. You're going to find death. You're going to have to work. Thorns and thistles, etc., etc. There's a hymn that we sing next Saturday. Well, yeah, next Saturday night at Vespers. Because next weekend, the well, weekend right before Great Lent begins, we commemorate the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise. We remember, and in all the services starting next Saturday night, we remember this great, tra the greatest tragedy that history has ever known or could ever. Where God's sons and daughters willfully turn their back on Him and end up as beggars when they should have been kings and queens. It's a beautiful hymn. And you know, the hymnographers of our church um, just don't state facts. They try to put themselves in the place of those people. And it's a beautiful hymn, and they say, Adam sits outside paradise now. And he's weeping and lamenting. All the wonderful things that God had prepared for him. He, he now knows what he did when he disobeyed God. And he weeps and he's wailing. Who or what does he ask to intercede with God? Remember, the world had Adam as a mediator between God. Adam and Eve were the mediator. It was when blessings came to creation, they came through Adam and Eve. Um, creation was only there for Adam and Eve. So here we have the king of creation. Listen next Saturday if you're here. He asks the trees an inanimate object to go that. He who was like the gardener now asks the garden to intercede with God. And he says, O oh, paradise, he sort of anthropomorphizes uh, paradise, by the rustlings, it's gorgeous, by the rustling of thy leaves. It's the sound of your leaves making noise. May God accept that as a prayer for me. And may God have mercy on me and recall me to paradise. I mean, really, it's a pathetic sight where Adam is asking the trees now, just by the noise of their leaves, to be a prayer to God because Adam finds himself unable even to pray to God. He feels so distant. That was man's state. But God was not going to let man stay like that. Man, you and me, Man is God's most precious creature. More precious than angels. There's nothing more precious to God than you and me. Sinners, yes. But there's nothing more precious to him. <coughs> Niagara Falls is beautiful and the planets are beautiful. Everything's beautiful. But God doesn't love them. They're nice. He made beautiful things for us. He made cosmos. You know that word? God created the cosmos, I mean, just as a new earth. It was everything that was created, He created that. For Adam and Eve to give them the ones he loves the most to give them beautiful things. We think of that word. Can we think of another English word that has that same uh, prefix? Other words in English that have come from this? Cosmetics is one. Cosmo that's when you go to get your hair fixed and stuff. I can't hear it so much. Well. Cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan, good. Cosmopolitan. But also cosmo, 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 we call it unit school. That's it, cosmopolitan. It's a lot. You know why? Because this doesn't just mean creation or the universe. In its root, it means an adornment. That's what it means. That all of creation was created by God, God the Word, 
Okay, they certainly they have one will, the Father and the Spirit, all cooperating, but it was the action of the Word of God created the entire cosmos as an adornment, as a decoration. Cross, that we might delight in all of this beautiful stuff. You know, we say cosmetics because you meet the ladies and put it on to become adorned, to make themselves beautiful or more beautiful. Cosmopolitan means that one is familiar with everything, right? You're not provincial. You know everything. Well, and it's rude. It means you know all the beautiful things of the world. You know philosophy, music, art, dance, and theology, and everything. You're a well-rounded, perfect kind of person if you're cosmopolitan. A cosmetologist is one who does the cosmetics, you know, who does the adorning or the decorating. So the point is that God created all of this as an adornment for us who now are out in the slums. We're far away from all that beautiful stuff that he created. But that's not God's will. God has a plan. It's called his economy. God has a plan. And nothing is going to thwart that plan. He's God. Even when we mess it up, he can fix it. And he will fix it. Not just can fix it. He will fix it. Adam and Eve got the train a little bit off track. We might go for a while, but God will get it back on track. 12.30? Well, we'll talk when we come back how he got it back on track. I have a half hour. It's 12 o'clock. Testament that Jesus tells that is the segue that we'll use uh, for why he came into the world. And he used it in that way. That parable is there. We sing it. Our chanters and our choirs sing about this in the Theotokian in the sixth tone. In this tone six, and you come to Vespers, listen to this. Jesus said that there was a woman who lost a piece of silver. And it made her sick. It would worry. And she wanted to find that piece of silver. You know that parable? If you don't, you might know the hymn. If you don't know the hymn, just listen. I'll tell you about it. Commentators on this scripture over the centuries, our fathers of our church, have explained to us why that piece of silver was so dear. It wasn't just like a dime or some quarter, even a silver dollar, but it's something more than just its intrinsic value didn't say gold, he said silver. And like now, so then. That's not the most precious metal. So Jesus used silver for a reason. And commentators tell us this, that it was part of that woman's wedding dowry. And it was part of her dowry, as Palestinians in many, in many Middle Eastern countries, they still do. It was that part with the coin that is passed from daughter, mother to daughter, mother to daughter, that they wear on their wedding day. And you keep it, and you pass that on to your daughter. Okay? So it was that headdress she wanted has the cords hanging from. She lost one of those silver pieces. And it had been in her family. It's not the gospel, but this is what the fathers are explaining to us. It had been in her family for generations. That's why that little dinky piece of silver that had very little intrinsic value was so important to that woman. It was important to her, maybe not to anybody else, but to her, it was the most important thing. Now the parable goes on that she cleaned her house and she swept in every corner and she lit candles and lamps, looked everywhere until she found that tiny little piece of silver, little tiny coin, for instance. And when she found it, she was so happy she called her neighbors to come and let's have a party. Now, that doesn't make much sense if you're looking at your die. Makes sense if that woman found something that really was a family heirloom that money could not buy for her. Her neighbors might have thought it strange, but it was nothing. But they understood it was her family heirloom. What's the point of the parable? Jesus just doesn't tell nice stories. Mary, well, who's the piece of silver? Well, What's that piece of silver? We are. And, that's the, uh, and who's the woman? The woman is Jesus. And I mean, it's, it's like he did one little 
He would go out. That's right. Because he wants to know That's it. You, me, every sinner, that's all of us, is that little piece of silver. In and of ourselves, we're not worth very much. I don't know what it is now, but when I was like a 8th grade, we used to say, do you know if you were taken down your elements and you're this and you're that, you're only worth like a dollar and a quarter? <laughs> so I mean, we're really not worth it. In our society, we're not worth very much. We kill our own babies by the millions. Our own children we kill. I mean, it's not worth anything. We see people dying and starving all over the world with other cultures could care less. You know, they kill baby girls in some cultures just because they're baby girls instead of baby boys. I mean, it's an awful world where humanity counts for nothing. But every one of those souls is like that little piece of silver to Jesus Christ who created us. To everybody else, it might not be worth anything. It's not about the intrinsic value. It's about what that piece of silver meant to that woman, and it's about what you mean to Jesus Christ. You are, and I don't mean generic mankind, I mean you Esther, and you Abla, and we Basil. Yeah, that's something. We are known by Christ by our name. He knew us from our mother's womb. And there's nothing more precious to God than me. And you, each one of you can say that, and you would all you are nothing more precious to him than you. And he'll do anything to find you. Anything to get you back. So this parable, this is how it works out. The woman, when she cleans her house, takes off her nice clothes, right? And she puts on her work clothes. She's going to move furniture. She's going to roll up carpet. She's going to dust. She's going to do everything. Put on a bandana around her head so it doesn't get all dirty. She puts on her work clothes. And that's what our God did in the Incarnation. Jesus Christ came and put on work clothes. That means flesh and blood. That's dirt. Flesh and blood, after all, is nothing but dust from the earth, right? Our God put on dust. The work clothes, blue jeans, if you will, of flesh and blood. And he came to find us. And like that woman, move furniture and look everywhere until she found it. So did our God. Where did he find us? In Hades. That's where he found us. That's where Adam and Eve were. And that's where all of us were going. In the grip of Satan. He even went there for us. That's how he found us. And when he found us, he says to the angels, Rejoice with me. For I have found the piece of silver which was lost. That's where we're here next Saturday night in the sixth stone. I'm telling you this to know how precious we are and why our God suffered. Not why he became man, but why he became man and suffered and died for us. It was not to appease some bloodthirsty God. It was the only way he could find us. God had, that's the justice, God had to submit to death in order to find us because we had submitted to death. The only way to get into the place of death, Hades, no live person could go there, is to be dead. And if that's where we were, that's where he was going. Just like that woman, she wanted to find that piece of silver, she had to move every piece of furniture. And she, who might have been a queen, had to get down on her knees. And if she's a nearsighted queen, like I'm a nearsighted bishop, I would not only be on my knees, I'd be about this far from the floor, looking for that tiny little piece of silver. Nothing stopped our God, not even hell would not stop our God from finding Adam. And when I speak of Adam, I mean he who now represents all of us, right? So he submitted even to death to find us. And when he found us, that was his joy. Can you imagine? That's what caused him joy that he found us. These terrible sinners, right? Depraved sinners and other people were these days. How could a depraved sinner bring such joy to a God? We're not depraved sinners. We are his most beloved who got sick. And who because of that sickness went far from him. As I said, he, it wasn't just the incarnation that was predicated upon Adam being lost. Others of our church say, again, God forbid, 
such a wonderful thing like the incarnation, putting on the flesh by God, was predicated by sin. That's not the case. Orthodoxy doesn't teach us that. Orthodoxy teaches us, yes, that his suffering and death and burial and resurrection, that was all what he did because we were sinners. But whether we sin or not, whether Adam and Eve ever sinned or not, his intention was always for his son to become man. Why? So that man might become like him. That's a heavy one, right? I see your face. That's a heavy one. God, we said God has this plan. For us, his beloved, just like, you know, husbands plan wonderful, forget husbands and wives, people who court today on Valentine's Day, they plan nice surprises and wonderful things and gifts and, and, and whatever it happens to be for their beloved. God planned all of this wonderful stuff for us, all the way to the end, where we were going to become like him. We messed it up, not him. There would have been no crucifixion and death of God. God died, you imagine, for us. But his incarnation, his becoming man, man human, would have happened anyway. Because the only way that dust can put on divinity is by divinity putting on the dust. He became, and the Father, you've heard this a million times, and this is what it means in the context in which we find ourselves now. God became man so that man might become God. We hear that all the time from so many fathers in the church over every century. God became man so that man might become God. And that's true whether there had been sin or not. Whether there had been death or not. I talked about the absurdity of love. And love causes us to do some rather absurd, silly things, even as human beings. I mean, think of some of the silly things that either your father did for your mother when tried to show how much he loved her, or your husbands do for you. You know, things that they wouldn't do in front of anybody else. <laughs> things that are very much out of character, right? Just to be silly because they love you. Well, you know, God did silly things for us. I don't mean to sound flippant about it, but just to make the parallel, God did something really crazy to the one he loved. And he loved us from even before he created us. We were always in his mind. There was never a time that he didn't conceive us. Well, God one day said, well, I think I'll create somebody to love. This was always, it's his pre-eternal plan. And he wanted to do these wonderful things for us. But the absurdity is that he's God. <laughs> and we're dust. We're the loaf of bread. And he's the baker. I mean, talk about being silly. We're, we're the table, and he's the carpenter, and he loves us, and has all of these plans for us, all of our life together throughout eternity, me the carpenter with my hammer, and my wife this table. I know what we're going to do throughout eternity. And I have all these wonderful things planned. That sounds insane, right? That's how God loves us. He is insanely in love with you as an individual. Corporately, certainly, but only corporately because it's individuals. God is crazy in love with you. So crazy that he, in his eternal plan, was going to become man. How am I going to make this pauper, I'm a king, okay, or a prince, how will I make this commoner royalty? I will marry her and make her who you know, sweeps the streets my princess. And then she's worldly, and people can't make fun of her anymore. She's mine, and she will be a prince, and she will be a queen, because I married her. Well, that's what our God does for us. Satan and all the fallen angels can say, that's just dust. That's just dust. Dust, dust, dust. And God says, no, I will make that dust God. I'll make him or her a king, a queen, God, like I am, by marrying her. And that's why the image is always of marriage, the bridegroom and the bride. It's not a master and slave. Uh, it's always lover and beloved. Bridegroom and bride. So in the incarnation, which is always going to happen, the Son of God became a human being while remaining a 
sun cloud. The carpenter became a piece of wood. The baker became a piece of dough. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the day were. Yeah. Paradise was fine. Paradise was fine. No, he redeemed us when he became man. That's not why he became man. He would have become man anyway. Paradise was a place, a nice place, where we were created, where we learned to relate to God. Well, he also blew it. But let's pretend there was no, well, just for a second. I'm certain to say it. Let's just pretend. We're talking about certain things here. Pretend we didn't blow it. We were not created to live eternally in paradise. When you die, you're not going to paradise. You're going to someplace better. You are going to his kingdom. That's a different place than paradise. Paradise was on this earth. Scripture tells us where it was on this earth. We're going someplace better than paradise. Yeah, but there was going to be a time when he ate of that tree. We bump into this tree again. The tree that we meet in the first book of the Bible, the first couple chapters of the Bible. Where do we meet that tree again? In Revelation. And what are we invited to do with that tree in Revelation? So it wasn't that that tree, again, was not put there as a temptation just to see if they're going to obey me. I'm going to put all these good things and one thing tell them don't eat just to see if they obey me. Again, that's a God who plays with people. Okay? That tree was there, and there would come a time when we could eat. It was in God's time. It was in God's time when he saw that we were mature. Adam and Eve were still like children. You, I mean, you see, they blamed each other. They were just like children. Instead of Eve even saying, I'm sorry, I ate the apple. I'm sorry I tempted Adam. She didn't say, I'm sorry, what? Like a little child, she blamed the snake. And Adam, like a little boy, blamed his wife. I didn't do it. She made me do it. We were immature as beings. You know, these aren't, again, this is not a fairy tale land. This is people just like you and I who grow in understanding, who grow in relationships, who grow in maturity. Here's Adam and Eve. They knew God, right? They should know God. But they thought they could hide among the trees from God. So they didn't have a perfect understanding of God yet. They were hiding from him. How did you hide from him? I'm his God. If you really knew me, why did you put him back? They were immature in their spiritual understanding of God. And that's why you don't eat of that tree. Later on, you will eat of that tree. And later on, my son will come and you'll come will leave paradise. And you will come as my bride to live with me in my kingdom. It's better than paradise. As long as Adam and Eve remain in paradise, they were human beings, very different from they were dust, enlivened by God. But through the incarnation, Jesus Christ makes it possible, by his own putting on, by divinity putting on dust, he makes it possible, it's the only way it's possible, for dust to put on divinity. And when Adam and Eve is no longer just dust, dust, the divine dust, just like the Son of God is now divine dust because of his humanity, you can take him to the kingdom. There is a human being in heaven. I'm not just talking about the mother of God or Elijah or Enoch. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. There never was a human being, there never was dust in heaven until the ascension. You know, we have that icon of the ascension we talked about last night with the disciples looking up like in wonder and the mother of God looking up in wonder and the angels from the Acts of the Apostles even saying to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up? But that's from our perspective. We're on earth. Imagine what was happening in heaven. We were in awe seeing a man going to heaven. Imagine what the citizens of heaven, the angels and the archangels, thought when they saw dust coming into the kingdom. I mean, if the men of Galilee were standing like this with their mouths open, if angels have bodies, I'm sure they were standing like this with their mouth. Do you see what I see? Here comes Adam, Christ being the son of Adam. Here comes that dirt. We saw him created from dirt. Here he comes, and he's coming here. And he's not just coming here to be with us. He's going to sit on the throne at the right hand of the Father. 
and we have to worship him. We're going to be worshiping dust now. That's new. I'm not saying the angels complained, but I'm sure they were more amazed than they had seen man coming into heaven than the apostles were amazed when they saw Jesus ascending to heaven. I mean, there was nothing like that before, ever, ever, ever. We saw a human being going up. No big deal. Elijah went up in the fiery chariot. Not, it's not a big deal, but it wasn't unique. But this is God coming up, covered with dirt, and he loves the dirt. He's going to keep that dirt forever. He has glorified that dirt, and that dirt's going to sit at the right hand of the Father, and we're going to bow before it, we're going to worship it, we're going to sing holy, 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 holy to that God who's covered with dirt. Dirt become God. It sounds so flippant, excuse me, that sounds bad, but I'm trying to make a point. This is something, it's really something. And it wasn't just to come and pay a debt to a God to pour out the blood so that we would go back to paradise and everything's hunky dory. That's not what it is. He came looking for us because he loved us. We went astray, we went off track, and by his coming, he gets us back on track. And now nothing can stop his plan. In the book of Revelations, we eat of that tree. What is the fruit? We eat of that tree now. What is the fruit? that hangs, like apples on a tree, what is the fruit that hangs on the tree of life? What is the tree of life and you'll know what it is that hangs on? The cross is the tree of life. And what's the fruit that hangs on that tree of life? The Son of God himself, Jesus Christ, right? And we eat of that fruit and we are made immortal. Adam and Eve had the possibility for being immortal. They weren't immortal. They were created with the possibility of becoming immortal. So we saw they weren't created immortal. They died. They did something they were equal to die. They had the possibility of becoming immortal. They got off track with our God's love. He's crazy in love. Absolutely crazy. Head over heels in love. And he would not let anything stop him from being with his beloved. So he put on his work clothes, he came, he said, somebody told him, well, Adam's down in hell. He said, I gotta go to hell. How do you get there? We gotta die. I'll die. Just let me get to hell, let me get to my beloved. I'm sort of making that conversation up, but it makes a point, right? <laughs> And now he doesn't go back to paradise. Adam doesn't go back to paradise. The thief went to paradise, right? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Because man had not yet gone to heaven. There was no man who ascended to heaven until the ascension. The thief went there on Good Friday. I mean, that's like, what, 42 days before the Lord got there. He couldn't get to heaven. To the kingdom of God. He went to this place, it's sort of a wonderful place, paradise, sounds delightful. And that's why it's called a garden of delight, paradise. That's why the thief went there. There's other euphemisms, the bosom of Abraham. Nobody went to the kingdom until it was made open by the God-man. He blazed the way for humanity to get to heaven. He made the path for us to get there. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the dead were raised as a sign of the resurrection. All those dead died again. Just like Lazarus raised, he was raised from the dead, but he died again. We'll all be raised in the, in the uh, general the resurrection on that great last day. But we're not going to paradise. Don't yearn for paradise. That was a nice place, but we're going someplace much better. He created paradise for these little children, like a playground and all these nice things. Until they grew, and then he wanted to marry them. I don't know, maybe my parables and my way of speaking were just confusing the issue. I don't, I don't know how else to, to say it. Paradise was wonderful. I don't want to say one more. But the kingdom is the kingdom. <coughs> Paradise. After they got out of Hades. Hades was the prison where all the dead went. Good and bad. Everybody. Good and bad. And if you look at the icon of the resurrection, we call it the resurrection, but it's the descent of Christ into Hades. 
This is not bottom, that's earth. And he's descending down into earth. So pretend it's a big hole in the earth here. Not Jesus standing on the flat Kansas with some mountains in Colorado. Okay, this is showing him descending from earth down into Hades. Again, it's, it's anthropomorph anthropomorphizing what's happening. This is Jesus' soul. His body's in the grave. This is not Jesus jumping out of the grave. This is his soul. While his body was in the grave, where did his soul go? The scripture tells us he descended to hell. This hell, not being the dominion of the demons right now, but hell, really Hades. Hades was a place of like shadows. It wasn't punishment, it wasn't the light, it was just a place where dead people were like a prison. And he descended there because he died. That's where the souls of the dead people went. And who does he find there, the ones he's looking for? Here's Adam. And here's Eve. They're dead. They're in their coffins here. And you can see him standing. These are the gates of Hades that looks like a cross. Are two doors that he knocked off their hinges. That's why they cross like that. And there's keys and hinges all broken way right underneath it. He knocked the brass gates of Hades off their hinges when he got there. He bound Satan. This guy who was all in the shadow of the chains around him. That's Satan who held the souls like in prison. He pulls and is powerful. His knees are bent on his arms outstretched. He's yanking Adam and Eve who have these expressions of great longing. Like, we knew you were coming. We took you so long to get us out of this place. He yanks them there. And who's on either side are the souls of all the other righteous who departed before him. John the Baptist. Here is Abel. The first person ever to die. That young man here is Abel. He's been in Hades longer than anybody. He was killed by his brother, right? Cain, killed Abel. The very first person ever to die. These are prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah. We have two kings over here. King David, who's an ancestor of Christ, and his son Solomon. Here's John the Baptist here, pointing to Jesus. This is the one I told you I saw on earth. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's here for us. And those who believed on him, I mean, why should, talk about justice, God's justice. Why should those who died, who lived and died before the incarnation, why should they be denied the opportunity to have eternal life in Christ just they were born at the wrong time? That's not justice. So that's what this is about, even those who died before his coming. John the Baptist preached there about his coming, just like he preached here. He for, was a forerunner on earth, and when his soul went to Hades, he told everybody there, the Lamb of God is coming. And when he came, he says, behold the Lamb of God. Just like he said to the Jordan, he says in this icon, now you look at it. He says the same thing to the souls in Hades, behold the Lamb of God. And Adam found his piece of silver. And he couldn't be happy. I mean, Christ found his piece of silver. And like the lady called the, the neighbors to come and rejoice with me, our Lord calls to the angels, come and rejoice with me. I have found the piece of silver that was lost. He tells us what causes angels to dance in heaven. It's when the sinner repents. There's more joy in heaven over the repentance of one sinner, right? You can make angels dance. Where that piece of silver is the most precious thing. And they rejoice because they see how happy Christ is. They are his servants there. And when their master is happy, they're thrilled because they know how much he loves us. That's what was accomplished by the resurrection, and the death, and the burial of Jesus Christ. And what was accomplished by his ascension was flesh became divinized in its it's the incarnation, but the ascension, that divinized flesh, that dust become dirt, was exalted and glorified, and is enthroned in the heavens. That's our humanity. It's our common humanity. I told you last night who we got it from. God did not create him anew. God the Father did not create him anew. Just got some dust and said, well, we did this last time, let's try it again. We'll try to get it right this time. And I'll make Jesus, the Son of God, can go into this new statue. And he didn't make a new human flesh. It's our human flesh. It's our human flesh that he took from her who is our sister. The same common human flesh that all of us have from our forefather and forefather. 
our humanity, not some humanity, our humanity, a part of me, is now seated at the right hand of the Father and waiting for all of me to get there. And until I get there, God grant I can bear you get there. Until I get there, I can't go with him there yet. But he can come and become a part of me here. And we'll do that tomorrow morning. He's going to offer us his flesh and blood. So he can be with me here until I can be with him there. That's the whole story of this incarnation. It's a love story. It's not a passion story. It's not a story that we need to sit around and weep about how terrible everything is. If we weep at all, it's about how much God loves us. They should be tears of happiness. If there's any sorrow, it's what our God had to endure to find us. And as I told you in that uh, illustration from that icon of the joy of our Lady, the joy, unexpected joy, you know, we can either cause him to bleed, really have a share in the responsibility for that crucifixion by our sins, or we can make his pain less by living holy lives. And we live holy lives by loving Him. So again, it's not about laws. It's about love. Let me say one thing, and then we'll quit, because I'm already three minutes over. There's another passage in Scripture, this time from the, the Gospel. It's our Lord's words that many people, many preachers misunderstand. The Orthodox is never misunderstood. It's this one, simple. It sounds awful if you don't have the right mind. The mind of the church is beautiful. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now that's like the Father saying, if you love me, you'll do what I tell you. Okay? That's not how our Lord said. It can sound out, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Somebody's saying, if you love me, you will do my commandments. Now, you need to see me to do that, right? It's not just in the words. If you love me, you'll do my commandments. You'll do what pleases me if you love me. Not if you love me, you'll do it. But it's just naturally. You do something to please the one whom you love if you really love him. Don't try to do commandments. Love me. That's the point of all of this. Forget do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. If you love me, you'll just automatically keep my commandments. Husbands and wives, you don't say, you please me, when you, if you love me, you'll do this to make me happy. You make me happy because you love me. That's why I give you gifts. Because it's predicated on love. It's not predicated on obedience. Obedience in the sense of keeping commandments, or obedience in the sense of pleasing someone. And wanting to please that person, the motivation is love. Okay. So when we hear that, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, it's not an ultimatum. It's not a direction. It's like, forget about the commandments. You'll get that part if you just love me. Love, honestly love me. Love me like you love your spouses or your children, and you'll automatically do that which pleases me, which is then the keeping of my commandments. It's not hard. St. Basil the Great, St. Simeon the Third Lord, Countless other saints have drawn this illustration. And again, some of you who have heard me preach now for 12 years, I've been your bishop. You've probably heard me use this illustration in other homilies, but it's most appropriate here before we break for lunch. And it has to do with motivation. The motivation for our creation was God's love. He loved just the idea of us, so he created them. The motivation for God's telling Adam and Eve. Enjoy everything, go eat of that tree, was love. I know what's going to happen if you eat of that tree. It's like telling a child, don't eat this, don't put the bread in your mouth to the baby, just give the baby the bottle. The baby's going to choke if you give it a piece of toast. Don't eat that yet. That was motivated by love. The allowance of death, God didn't create that, but he used it for something very good. And the Father said, it's a mercy that God allowed death to continue. Because evil ends. Without death, evil would be immortal. But when we die, 
which God certainly didn't intend, but he, something good came out of that. Evil dies. We stop sinning when we die. So there's even something good. God made something good even in the ugliness of death. That was because of his love for us. His warning of us in Adam and Eve. What's going to happen when we leave paradise? It was motivated by love. You're little children. I took good care of you. Here. Out there you're going to have to work. And I can't help you anymore. I can't protect you anymore out there like I did here. That was motivated by love. His giving of the law in the Old Testament was motivated by his love. His sending of the prophets was motivated by his love, treating us until we matured, until the fullness of time. When men could, his tolerance of polygamy and concubines in the Old Testament was because we were weak people. In the Old, in the New Testament, virginity is here. While in the Old Testament, we see people, holy people, Solomon, 5,000 wives for God's sake, concubines. He's the same. He's here. Things were tolerated by our God. He was patient with us because he loved us. Through all of those centuries and millennia of preparation, until the fullness of time came and he sent his son born under the law, born of a woman under the law. It was all motivated by love. His incarnation, putting on the flesh, was motivated by love. His suffering, his death, his everything, his resurrection, his ascension, was motivated by love. And our relationship, our relationship with him then, what he desires, is that we love him. When I was priest in Wichita, and this is where some of you might recognize the story, I preached the homily one Sunday, and I said this. You know, from Pennsylvania, again, Western Pennsylvania, where there's lots of Orthodox, lots of Catholics, and the Protestants who are there are like normal denominations, Presbyterian, Methodist, and, you know, like normal, like the Lutherans. So we didn't hear out of this, are you saved, are you saved, are you saved, I'm saved, are you saved? I got the Wichita and this man invited me to a party, not to the church. Uh, a friend of a friend invited me to a luncheon. He was with a host. It was like the anniversary of the day he got saved. Uh, I don't know, any cards for that? Or what do you say? Congratulations, I don't know what. So I was not like used to, I certainly heard it, I'm not naive. But when I got the Wichita, I heard him, are you saved? You know, my neighbor lady, first of all, hello, on the base on the job. I'm so and so, are you saved? So one Sunday I preached, I said, you know, since I've gotten here, and I know it's even more prevalent down here than it is up there, this thing about, are you saved? And I told the people, thank you my congregation, I said, I've heard so much of it. I don't care if I am. And there was this huge gasp in the back left corner of the church. It was the Sunday school class from the West Side Baptist Church. <laughs> I think we always had like a bunch of dead Baptists. <laughs> the rest of them were cool. I think they were surprised, but they didn't gasp. And this is what I meant when I went on the poll so we didn't die. I said, look, St. Basil and St. Simeon, all the fathers of our church, and this book surely tells us that our motivation should not be our salvation. Our motivation should be that we love God. It was an old Beatles song. I love it. There was an old Beatles song. Um, remember, pretend there's no heaven, there's no hell. Imagine, yeah. there is a heaven and a hell, but let's just keep the, those lyrics for a second. Pretend there was no hell, or imagine there's no heaven, and imagine there's no hell. Would you still not love God? I mean, do we only love God to go to heaven? And the fathers, this is what they say, St. Simeon, St. Basil, and others. If you only do things to please God, if you only keep his commandments, you only do his will to go to heaven so you can tell everybody you're saved, you're no better than a hired servant. You're doing what the boss wants so that you get paid. And that's awful. On the other hand, there are those who tell you all about hell and they threaten you with the eternal flames of hell, and they do exist. But that's why you should obey, to avoid hell. If you don't, you're going to go to hell. And th th those people who smoke and play cards and wear makeup and dance, you're going to go to hell. And this one's going to go to hell, and if you don't repent, you're going to go to hell. So that your repentance, your keeping of commandments, your doing of his will, is based upon escaping hell. 
and St. Basil and St. Simeon the New Theologian, and this book teaches us, if you do that, you're no better than a slave. Doing what the master told you so you don't get punished. He says, I don't, get, I don't call you servants anymore. I call you my friends. Our motivation then, and that's why I made the Baptist cast, which was not my intent, I didn't know they were there, but it made a good point. When I said, I don't care if I'm saved, that's not my motivation. I, that should not be what's in my brain 24 hours a day. My, what's in my brain, if I say I love God, if I love him, how do I please him? And if there's a heaven and he allows me in, it's his place, thank God, I would love him. And if there's a hell and he thinks I'm bound for hell or I, I deserve to go to hell, I love him. Let him send me to hell. I love him. I'll do whatever he wants. He wants me to go to hell, I'll go to hell. He went to hell for me because he loved me. That's the motivation. Saint, the saints of your church, this will teach us that everything we do ought not be to attain heaven or to escape hell. What we do ought be motivated on love for God. Like everything he did for us was motivated Love. Is that a nice place to wrap it up? One question here. Excuse me, you mentioned something about the theology of Catholicism. Particularly what? Catholicism. Catholicism, yes. I, I don't want to say what they do because I've never been a Calvinist. I don't know Calvinists, but I do know this. I do know this. And it's something, no, I don't want to say I know this. I perceive this. I perceive they don't say much about God the Father. Everything's Jesus. And if you're an apostle or something like that, you also have the Holy Spirit. But everything is Jesus, 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 which is fine. There's no more beautiful name. Every knee should buy all the, uh, that name. But how about the Father? And if their the relationship is with Jesus, you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Well, that is typically Protestant. Typically. It's not just Jesus. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you have a relationship with the Father and, and the Spirit. It's one God and three persons. But if the Father is this frightening, bloodthirsty God who has a justice that even his mercy can't temper, it's a justice that he's bound by. For us, it's not even God who's bound by anyone. A, a justice that must be appeased in order for him not to be furious and angry with us. I can see why they don't mention the Father too much. I can see that. Every prayer is ended in the name of Jesus, which is fine. That's here. But I mean, God is Trinity. Jesus' will is identical to the Father and the Holy Spirit. There are Protestants, I don't know what the denomination they would be because I'm not an expert on who don't know the Our Father. You can go to a Protestant service all your life and never say the Our Father. It's hard for us to do anything without praying the Our Father. We were taught, teach us how to pray. You would think everybody who calls himself a Christian would pray that. But there are some who don't even know it. And it makes sense to me that you sort of, I mean, he's angry, so I'm not going to bother him. I'm not going to be, if he doesn't see me and I don't see him, you know, maybe he'll forget all about him. But that's a God who predestines and Calvinists do. They take this to its logical conclusion. There are some, and there's double predestination, not just those who are predestined for heaven, but those who are predestined for hell. Man, what do you do? Now, I can answer that. You know, God does know. God, He's God. He knew us before He even created us. I mean, that's what makes Him God. St. John Chrysostom answers this. If God knows something, foreknows something, um, that has to happen. What God knows is not a lie. It's not false. So God, is, again, it's sort of simplified. God can like look into the future and see if Bishop Angel is going to go to heaven or hell. He's God. He can do that. But once he sees me, it's done. Right? John Chrysostom said this. It's love. God loves us so much that any of his powers that he possesses as God, any power that would in 
any way impinge upon our free will, God, because of his love, freely restricts. He freely, as an act of love, restricts his own power to know things if knowing things or doing things would impinge upon my free will. And again, what's the motivation? It's love. Mary. Well, I just love first John Paul. Thank you. Read it first. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, but God, God, God is love. love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. He sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and we love us. It's all about love. It's not God's 